and you, and you, and you, and you were there. Some of it wasn't very nice, but most of it was beautiful. Hello, and welcome to Dream Idiots. Welcome back. Uh, hello, hello. Thanks, thanks for being here. Thanks for listening. I uh, hope you're enjoying the show. We're up to episode 36, which is kind of hard to believe. Um, check us out, dreamidiots.com. Buy your t-shirts. We got t-shirts. We got stickers. We still have the Ted Cruz t-shirt, if you're interested in that. Um, so we got lots of stuff going on for Dream Idiots. And as always, rate and review us on whatever platform you're using. And Brian, I think you're going to start us off with a couple of updates this week on previous stories. Um, well, uh, before that, I was going to mention... Um... Quickly, oh, um, I am going to add um, to the store. There's the there's the tie dye shirt, which will be up as well here. If you want to, if you want to look look at that, and then just wanted to say thanks for listening and downloading and doing those things. Uh, actually, at this point in September, we already have as many loads, as many listens and downloads in September as we've as we did in all of August. So, uh, oh, folks are folks are definitely listening. Someone who's a profound glutton for punishment uh, in San Antonio, I happen to notice, downloaded all 35, 35 episodes uh, in like a 36-hour period of time. <laughs> and then uh, someone else, weirdly in Austria, has, I mean, this has to be one the same person, downloaded seven episodes all on one day. Um, because Dream Idiots are so good, yeah? I mean, I, you know... <laughs> Jimmy did make me laugh. Ha ha. So um, thank you for doing that. We appreciate it. Um, but yes, like and subscribe and share and do all those things. Um, that would be fabulous. Um, I did have one um, current event item, news item um, out there. And, uh, you know, we may periodically, you know, um, not every episode, maybe just occasionally, but I keep coming across uh, stories that I see in the news that are worth um, ridiculing and mocking mercilessly. And so this is one of those cases. Um, have you ever heard of the uh, term nitrogen hypoxia? Um, I, I want to say I have, but I don't know <laughs> for sure. I've heard of okay. nitrogen narcosis, but... Uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, not quite the same thing. So we're headed to that, that hotbed of intellectualism and, and social justice. that is the great state of Alabama roll tide. Um, nitrogen hypoxia is being considered in, uh, Alabama as a means of execution. So there is right now a man on death row in, in Alabama. Uh, his name is Alan Eugene Miller. Uh, he is set to be executed on September 22nd, so this week. Um, and you know, I'm not a you know diehard lefty crazy liberal where I don't think people should be punished. This guy's a he's, he's a bad dude. He killed three people in a workplace shooting in 1999. He's an awful human being. I am fervently, passionately against the death penalty, and this is not a, not a situation where there's any question about the man's guilt. But as you may have read a few, a few years ago, there have been a number of instances in the last, I want to say, three years where lethal injections went spectacularly awry. Uh, and the reason lethal injection is done is because it's allegedly humane or you know, whatever, pain-free or something. And a couple of instances went awfully you know, wrong, went, went really, really badly. This guy says that he opted in for nitrogen hypoxia because it's now been approved in Alabama, Oklahoma, and Mississippi as a means of execution, even though no one has ever used it. It has never been done. And so um, nitrogen hypoxia basically is, you know, the air that we breathe is like 78% nitrogen and 20% oxygen and the rest is helium and hydrogen, methane and other and other things. You can kill a person via this means by basically ramping up the nitrogen and, and sucking out the oxygen. Um, nitrogen is inert, but when you don't have oxygen, you will die. So this is basically killing someone with a pillow, as far as I can tell. This is asphyxiation. Uh, and the reason this dumbass requested it apparently is because he has a fear of needles like dude you're you're you know your ra random fears <laughs> don't seem that relevant i mean it's cruel and unusual either way but 
my general impression is that lethal injection is at least comparatively humane. If you are, if you are deprived of oxygen uh, in this way, just imagine being underwater in a pool uh, and not being able to breathe. So at sea level, if there's 20% oxygen, you know, a mile up, like where you live, you know, it can get down to 16% where breathing can become difficult at four or 5%, you can, you know, enter into a coma and then you'll die. But this takes many, many, many seconds. Uh, and so, I don't know. I just saw this in the news and I was like, they're going to do what? Uh, of course, in Texas, you know, if your IQ here is the same as your waist size, they'll execute you um, because they just don't. I mean, uh, you know, in this country, allegedly, you have the right to not be subjected to cruel or unusual punishment. And increasingly, it just feels like the cruelty is the point. And this just feels like an unbelievably cruel thing that is that, that may become reasonably common. It probably won't become the standard, but I'm just blown away that this is even being considered. It, it's almost like backing a pickup truck up to the room where they're in, putting a garden hose in the exhaust pipe and running that under the door would be better. Yeah, I mean, I mean that, that that's probably similar. I mean, uh, I mean, um, you know, I don't, I've never witnessed that. Um, I think execution is just reprehensible. I, I, I can see how perhaps if I had a family member that was the victim of a horrendous crime, I would want some awfully vengeful punishment. Maybe I don't think that I would. I don't. I, I could. I, I can't conceive of a scenario in which I'd want to witness an ex, witness an execution. Um, you know, people in Texas especially think this is incredibly important uh and i'm just you know endlessly blown away by the fact that this is something that we do considering it is irrefutable that there there have been dozens potentially hundreds of people who have been executed over you know decades and decades because law enforcement is corrupt and terrible and lazy and people get convicted of crimes and then after you've executed them there's nothing you can fucking do about it when you find out that they that they weren't actually the, the culprit so you know making you know grinding the knife in even, even worse so to speak is this thing where your lungs are going to fucking explode uh and you know i don't know this guy you know, you know eugene miller is obviously a bad human being but he's still a human being he still has rights and uh i just i'm stunned that this is a thing and uh I mean, i'm just trying to trying to imagine also you know the french revolution and was it louis, louis the 15th or louis the 16th that was what that was guillotined and him you know i'm, I'm imagining him trying to say he, he well, was louis the he was louis the 15th and the 16th <laughs> I, i'm just I mean, imagine i'm mean, trying to imagine him or someone like that saying, well, I have, I have a fear of big, shiny knives that go shunk. <laughs> like, like, no, uh, I mean, you can't, you know, I, I don't get why this guy has requested this, but because uh, it just sounds fucking awful. Uh, I mean, by all means, b you know, okay, Alabama, build a guillotine. That's more humane. Well, Spend. some guys, some, some guys have requested in, in states where it's still, uh, you know, firing squad is still, we'll, we'll take the firing squad because right, it's right. a bigger spectacle because it's, it really gets in your face as to look what they're doing. It's not a matter of putting a needle in an arm. They're putting a bullet in someone's heart as right. opposed to a needle in the arm. And it's much more uh, visceral. It's much more bloody and, and um, confrontational about you're taking, the state is taking someone's life. Right. Right. And I, part of me says, if we're going to do this and we shouldn't, because I'm like you, let's make it horrible and gross. I mean, let's <laughs> crazy. let's show people what it's I mean, let's put it on Fox. This is, this is reality TV. He's it's, going to sleep. He's not going to sleep. You're paralyzing him and stopping his heart is what you're doing. Right. And I, I don't know. I'm also picturing going the route that I suggested with the car engine and, and running the hose under the door uh, and then it failing and the other guy saying something like that's what you get for driving a chevy <laughs> right no nah, it's just awful just another example yeah it's just a yeah just a, just a train wreck and and, and and the thing i also just i still can't believe that you know that we will tell someone okay timmy it's time for us to we're gonna give you that magic shot that, that sends you to sleep sleep 
because there are people that are so mentally damaged and with IQs, you know, below 70 who have been executed in this state, uh, mm -hmm. who likely have no fucking idea what's going on. Um, uh, but well, we, that's, this is Texas, you know, don't mess with Texas. Bang, bang, bang. We've got to have some justice. Uh, and, and we have, you know, ass fucks like, uh, Greg Abbott and Ted Cruz, um, fuck Ted Cruz, by the way. I mean, I mean, ass <laughs> fuck in the best possible sense of the word, by the way, but so anyway, <laughs> Well, on that note, <laughs> so, but, um, Google this, you know, just go on Google, type in nitrogen hypoxia, you know, on the, on the 22nd, this guy is supposed to be executed by some means. Uh, and I'll be very curious to see if this is this, you know, simple benign little procedure or whether it is completely awful. I'm betting it's going to be the latter. I think it uh, is too. I think you're right. Yeah, but anyway, this, um, most of this comes from an NPR article that came out last week on the 13th by um, Ayana Archie. But there's there are many many articles about you know about this uh, out there. Well, thank you, Brian. I'll have to look that up. That's a that is a that's a that's a brutal one. Yeah. Um, and and with that in mind, let me say that today's story I put together something a little lighthearted. <laughs> <laughs> especially compared to what we just did. But uh, in, uh, uh, we got pretty serious last week as well. And so I want to do something kind of lighthearted this week for my story. And I'm going first. So I'm going to get going. Um, Brian, have you ever thought about the similarities between baseball players and musicians on tour? Have I thought about that? Um, I have not thought about that. Now that you mentioned, I can see how there there could be some similarities. You've got a lot of, lot, you know, you're on the road. You've got to get, deal with the group dynamics of of living, working, performing, and traveling to the same bunch of people, the lulls of boredom, boredom in between, even when you're doing gigs. So what I'd like to do to, today, tonight, now, is present to you some stories of things that jazz musicians have tried to do while performing <laughs> or on the road. Uh -huh, okay. um, a classic story, the source of which I cannot find. The rest of these come from an excellent book by Bill Crow, a book called Jazz Anecdotes. But this first one, I don't know where this comes from. I couldn't find the source for it. I think it involves Sidney Bechet, the legendary clarinetist and, and saxophonist of the early days of jazz. And he was performing on stage one time, and I believe this is down in New Orleans. And uh, a young player kind of crept on stage to try his hand against the master mm -hmm. in a cutting contest. And uh, Bechet didn't he, he booked no tolerance for this and he blew him off the stage in just a few bars. I mean, just destroyed the guy in, in a cutting contest where he could even get started. So the kid uh, tried to sneak off the stage and out a side door. So Bechet promptly swung around, followed him down off the stage, out the door <laughs> and down the street, clarinetting at him all the way. Um, I don't know if that's left, true. Left or not. the venue. <laughs> yes. I don't know if that's true or not, but, but uh I love that story. And so that's the spirit of, of some of the jazz anecdotes that I'm going to be sharing from Bill Crow's book tonight. I'm going to start with Ellington. Uh, Duke Ellington's various orchestras, and he held, a, he held a working big band together for decades. And in the, you know, the war years, as, as you know, Brian, you're a jazz guy too. I mean, masterpieces just tumbled out of that band. Uh, um, Harlem Airshaft and Coco and all these great songs came out of, of the Ellington orchestras, but it was also full of a lot of guys who liked to pull pranks. And apparently uh, trombonist Juan Tizal was one of the worst who once in a performance actually lit a stink bomb on stage. <laughs> and uh, when the rest of the band found out who did it the next night, they took his tuxedo and put itching powder all in his tuxedo and all of his clothes and the next night, he lasted about halfway through the first number before he ran off straight stage, scratching and cursing. <laughs> um, Bonnie Bar uh, Barney Bigard, who was a clarinetist, got tired of someone stealing his whiskey when he was taking naps. So one day he he faked a nap, and Junior <laughs> Raglan, who was a bassist, snuck up and took his whiskey bottle uncapped and took a huge swig. And just then, Bigard sat up and said, "Now I hope you know what you just did." And he he had a, basically a mouthful of urine. Urine. The <laughs> yeah, I can I can see that one coming. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Rex Stewart had a similar problem where his stash of whiskey was being drained dry, so he replaced it for the next night without saying a word, and it was chugged prior to a performance by several of the other orchestra members, who found out during their set that Stewart had laced the whiskey with castor oil. Oh God! You know what castor oil does? <laughs> yeah. 
Hmm. Makes you Every, everybody out. <laughs> Co- Cody Williams trumpeter said, Oh, what a time we had on the stand that night. Couple more trumpet players, Freddie Jenkins and Artie Wetzel, uh, fell would fall prey to instrument sabotage. Jen- <laughs> Jenkins found out in the middle of a set that his mouthpiece had been smeared with Limburger cheese and cayenne pepper. <laughs> <laughs> And someone once took uh, Wetzel's trumpet apart and turned the valves around backwards. So he, when he pressed the valves down, no sound came out. <laughs> so he gets up to take a solo and it's just nothing. And he's shaking his trumpet and Ellington is just staring him down. <laughs> um, Billy Holiday, the great vocals, Billy Holiday. And I don't listen to a lot of vocal jazz, but I've got a couple of Billy Holiday collections that are really tremendous. And she tells the story of a craps game on a bus ride from West Virginia to New York. She was down to her last $4 and she proceeded to get into a craps game in the back of the bus where by the time they got to New York, she quote, was filthy dirty, had holes in the knees of her stockings, but $1,600 in change in her pocket. (laughs) Shit. She gave, she gave, (laughs) 30 she pounds. Gave the, yeah, she gave the bulk of the money to her mother, who eventually put that money to good use and started a restaurant called Mom Holidays. Um, vibraphone is Terry Gibbs. Uh, the vibraphone is another instrument I never really appreciated until I got into uh, guys like Bobby Hutcherson and, and so forth. Uh, Terry Gibbs and uh, Jason, Jason Marsalis is a vibraphonist. But he was invited to share the stage. Uh, Terry Gibbs was. He was decided. He was invited to share band leader Buddy Rich, the great drummer. Uh, Buddy Rich said, "Hey, come along and why don't you take a ride with me?" And so they got in his Cadillac rather than ride the tour bus. And he said that Buddy Rich drove very, very fast. And each night Terry would run off a list of the guys in the band he thought should take solos. And the very next gig there'd be no solos. So after about a week of this, Buddy stops the car in the middle of the desert and says, "Wait a minute, I've had enough of this shit." You've been telling me how to run my band for a week. Get out, take the bus. And he kicked him out in the middle of the desert and took off. And he'd been driving so fast, Gibbs had to wait over two hours for the trailing bus to catch up. (laughs) Violinist Stuff Smith. Another thing we don't think about jazz violin is Stefan Grappelli, Stuff Smith, a couple others, once bought a brand new LaSalle from a car dealer in Chicago. And he wrecked it driving out of the showroom. (laughs) he promptly went right back in and bought a second one and on the next tour of chicago the band was taking requests and someone from the audience handed a slip of paper which turned out to be a summons for the first car Uh, he just left it there in the street the whole band's wages were garnished (laughs) uh pianist claude thornhill who also ran an orchestra pulled something pretty interesting during a tour they were traveling through arizona so he stopped the bus and had the entire orchestra line up and play chords into the grand canyon they stood for a long while and listened to all of the echoes bouncing back and forth and in due course a huge crowd of listeners surrounded them (laughs) could you imagine visiting (laughs) the grand canyon and this jazz orchestra just trops along and starts playing as loudly as they can uh uh, baritone saxophonist Serge Shaloff was a menace, particularly on hotel rooms and hotel managers. He would often burn three foot long holes in mattresses because he would fall asleep smoking. But then he would uh, he would berate the manager when they would try to <laughs> they would try to get him to pay for it. You'd say things like, how dare you talk to me that way? I happen to be the downbeat and metronome pole winner. And eventually <laughs> the manager ended up apologizing to him. Uh, one particular manager didn't put up with the nonsense. He demanded that Shaloff pay him after the musician decided to have target practice with a pistol in his hotel room. <laughs> Shooting holes through the door. The manager de- demanded a payment of $24. So he paid him and then had vibraphonist Terry Gibbs from earlier. He mm-hmm. had him he had him remove the door and carry it to the tour bus because he paid for it. He <laughs> considered for it, it his. Right. <laughs> Alto saxophonist Phil Woods would teach jazz classes and what he would like what he liked to do once a year is he would take the al the a lab band ensemble i guess that's like the the starting starting lineup basically he'd get them in the parking lot with all their instruments uniforms music sheets and equipment and he'd make him pack the bus he would close all the blinds and this is a quote and just drive around the campus for eight hours <laughs> they would get out get dressed set up the equipment pick out a set and tune up then 
they would put everything away and wouldn't play at all. He'd make them change clothes, <laughs> repack the bus, close the blind, blinds, and drive them around for another eight hours. And then he'd stop the bus at the end and say, all right, who wants to do this for a living? Because this is what it is. <laughs> God. That, that's, that's being committed to a joke. <laughs> all, all, all those saxophonist Jimmy Ford, and he was a, uh, I believe he was a Texas saxophonist, and they're a different breed altogether. He once yelled at, yelled at a baritone saxophone player, hey, give me a reed. And so the guy handed him a reed, but he had no idea how Ford was going to use it on his alto sax because his right. reed was for a baritone yeah, it's sax. It's like twice the size. Then. Right. So Ford pulled out a small cup of ice cream and used the reed as a scoop to eat his ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Mm-hmm. Roy Eldridge trumpeter I just heard Roy Eldridge tune driving around the car tonight he liked to mess with the mm-hmm. other, other trumpet players by he, he'd act like he was drunk and he'd wait for young gun some young gun to call him up to the stage at, for a cutting contest and he'd promptly sober up real quick and quote get up and blow everybody out of the building <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> vibraphonist Terry Gibbs was sharing an instrument with Milt Jackson during a radio broadcast. They would take turns performing numbers. So Jackson went first. Then he disconnected the damper bar from the pedal so Gibbs couldn't sustain notes during his performance. (laughs) Basically playing a xylophone, I think. So before Jackson's next number, Gibbs moved all of the bars in the front row one slot to the left. So all the the flats and sharps were messed up. And Gibbs was quoted as saying, didn't do any good. He still played better than me. Uh, trombonist Jack Rains, who ran into a contractor, a music contractor who's doing scores for films at a bar, needed a bass trombonist, which I didn't even know was a thing. Yeah, so Ra- Rains was the only trombonist in the bar. And he said, I need you to play some bass trombone on a date starting in half an hour. And Rains responded, I'm sorry, I don't play bass trombone. Well, I'll rent one for you, okay? And Rains says, sure, while you're at it, rent me an alto sax. I don't play that either. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, guitarist Eddie Condon and drummer George Wetling played for the Artie Shaw band together. And they had to wear uniforms that had a really pair of ugly shoes. In order to save uniform expenses, the men shared a pair of shoes. At the same time, Ernie Condon, at one point in the performance, I had to stand up, put my right foot on a chair and play a 16 bar solo. Otherwise, both of my feet were hidden behind a music stand. Wetling's right foot was hidden by his bass drum and his left was visible to the audience. <laughs> yeah. So he shared a pair of brown spade atrocities. <laughs> George wore the left one. I wore the right one. Um, the And I'm going to close with this, this fella, because he, uh, he kind of takes it back to your, one of your um, topics from an earlier episode. The Biddy Goodman Orchestra had its own Yogi Berra with Italian-born saxophonist Vito, that's V-I-D-O, Vito Musso. Vito had a loose grasp of the English language. And uh, on the bus rides between gigs, the fellows in the band would play a game where someone would give the initials of a band leader and the others had to guess who that was. So when it came term, time for Vito, Vito said E-C. So the guys guessed Ernie Condon? Shook his head no. Emil Coleman? Shook his head no. This went on for a while. And they finally gave up. And they said, Vito, who are you talking about? And he said, E.C. Xavier Kugat. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> Another time he was on a tour bus and he desperately needed some fresh air. So he yelled out, if somebody don't open a window right now, we'll all get sophisticated. <laughs> and as a means mm. to wrap it up, because I think this is perfect mm. because of someone who admires mm. jazz from afar. I think Vito is wrong in what he's saying, but he's absolutely right in the spirit. Once he was overheard in a conversation saying to a fellow musician, music is a very hard instrument. <laughs> yeah. Sources for this piece were the NPR Curious Listener's Guide to Jazz by Lauren Schonenberg, Jazz Anecdotes by Bill Crow, A plus E Interactive, uh, which I'll get to in a moment. That's from the Bay Area Entertainment blog, and it was an interview with Nicholas Payton and Wikipedia for other other uh, information. So there you go. Stories from the jazz world. Nice. And, uh, Very good. What, what those guys did to entertain themselves on the road. And that brings us to our middle break, right, Brian, which is the. It, we are indeed. And we're, we're going to we're going to do something a little different because normally Brian presents it. So here we go. 
It's time for the Dream Idiot's Curse Word of the Week. So, Brian, mm -hmm. here, here's the curse word of the week. Jazz. <laughs> huh. Uh, so it has some has a, has a second meaning besides the style of music? I have no idea. Well, uh, Schoenberg's NPR Curious Listener's Guide to Jazz says that jazz was, quote, a problematic word from the beginning. It derives from the word jazz, J-A-S-S, -S, uh -huh. which is an implication of excitement, energy, and vitality. Some folks that have argued that jazz is derived from jassm, J-A-S-M, which itself is a variant of jism or jizz, meaning mm -hmm. semen. <laughs> it's also curious that these coincide with another word that combines energy with male bodily fluid, which is spunk. Spunk is in the same vein, believe it or not. Now, some early folks in the music scene wanted to call uh wanted, wanted to, to call, call jazz spunk. <laughs> no, no, no. They wanted to call it something entirely different. Duke Ellington argued that we shouldn't be calling it jazz, we should be calling it American Negro music. That never caught on. But modern trumpet player Nicholas Payton prefers. Have you heard about what he prefers to call it? No. Uh. Okay. He prefers the word BAM, B-A-M, which stands for Black American Music. His argument is that is is that jazz music is is a problematic term because it's it's a way to I think he sees it as being have, having been uh, I don't want to say corrupted but uh, he feels that bam gets to the heart of the matter better with right the without any any sort of negative affiliation yeah yeah back, uh, yeah I kind of like that actually yeah and some some other folks have taken that on uh, with with what they call jazz i still use jazz because that's the word that uh, i've always learned so there you go curse word right. of the week jazz jazz wow okay nice what you got for us this week brian all right well we are we are moving on here uh i'm going to tell you uh, a story this week about a man named billy barr um if you google this man's name uh in he is he's definitely googleable and it'll say very very clearly that he prefers lowercase b i l l y lowercase b a r r this is not the bloviated former ag but uh, a different individual um this you know as of as of our recording billy is now probably about uh 70 years old or so and billy grew up in uh, New Jersey. As a shy, skinny kid, uh, he was in st studying environmental science at Rutgers University, but his life in New Jersey wasn't going quite as he liked it. He was looking for some isolation and some quiet, and the bustle of sort of a bigger city existence was frankly leaving him borderline depressed. And so he decided to to travel west. Uh, so he left, he dropped out of college in 1973 and headed his way to your neck of the word, your, your neck of the woods, uh, Gothic, Colorado. And in 73, he, um, you know, started living basically at the base of Gothic mountain and Gothic mountain is this 12,600 foot high structure. It looks, it looks vaguely like, uh, El Capitan in, in some of the pictures. And, uh, in the winters he was living in, uh, this tiny little shack, uh, in a, this little eight by 10, um, you know, outbuilding, basically old, old spare building. He had, uh, roommates that were a skunk and a pine Martin. And uh, a pine Martin is basically a, it's kind of an American weasel basically. Uh, and they were his only, only company for much of the year. Uh, but he moved out there because he, uh, precisely because he wanted uh, solitude, he wanted quiet, he wanted a different type of life. But he was also an inquisitive person, exceptionally bright, uh, and he couldn't escape the boredom of, um, of, his, you know, of his time uh, in the mountains. His first winter there, he, he started to um, measure snow levels. And so twice a day, he would go outside and measure how much snow had fallen during the night. And then 12 hours later, he would measure the amount of snow that had fallen during the day, and he'd start keeping track. 
uh, in addition to this, he would uh, note animal tracks. He would make a note of when certain mammals were coming out of hibernation, and he became fairly adept at identifying bird calls and when various other animals were in the area and he could he could hear them and he started taking notes of all these various observations in this in this it was standard little binder and uh he would fill up up, up, one, up one binder which took three years and then, he, then he'd move on to the next binder and he's been doing this now for 50 years um he's still there so he is, um, you know, he's just an amateur scientist, but he became closely affiliated with with what's called the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory. And I'll keep referring to it as the RMBL through the rest of this. Uh, and so during the last couple of decades, this facility has become really at the forefront of sort of climate science. Uh, and, you know, when it started back in the 70s, it was frankly it sort of seemed like it was a bit of a slapdash kind of run like a non-profit all hands on deck sort of um facility where uh you know people had to wash the dishes and if you backed up the toilet you had to probably had to plunge it yourself and you know that sort of approach but they, they they didn't have much you know many records on hand at the time but they were looking into uh you know flora and fauna and different types of flowers and when they bloomed and and um how you know, how the timing of this, um, of these flowers and when they bloomed impacted bugs and birds and butterflies and, and these types of things. Uh, and so this has evolved over time. The site of the RMBL is, uh, is a ghost town. So this was an area that was heavily mined for silver for about 10 years in the, the very tail end of the 19th century. So, so about 1880 to 1890, 1892, silver is being pulled out of the mountain. And then the silver kind of runs dry. The place is abandoned. They go, you know, start digging silver out of, of mines that are more productive. And so there is, you know, this building that winds up being his home, at least initially, was an outbuilding for this mine that was, you know, that was when he gets there, uh, you know, nearly 100 years old, 90 years old. Uh, in 1928, a that's when a first uh, biology, uh, biology professor comes to the area and basically starts building up this facility and what they sort of deem this summer pilgrimage of scientists. And, um, you know, it's every, every summer for, for three months, there's this ragtag group of folks that are doing research and they're sharing mess halls and it's students working, you know, doing internships with professors. And again, it's this, this sort of mix of folks doing research very, very broadly on things tied to environmental science and conservation. One of the guys who is there at, at this time as well, early 70s, uh, is an ecologist named uh, David Inouye. And we'll come back to David here in a moment. So uh, the same year that Barr comes to this area and becomes Gothic's only permanent resident, um, this is when Inouye, at the same time, <laughs> Inouye is studying all these wild, wildflowers. And his, his focus is on um, flowers and how they and how they impact the, you know, the local area. He has 30 plots of flowers in this area. Uh, and he really, really is, is trying to determine how these flowering plants and how they're evolving over time are basically are affecting the, the general ecology of the broader areas is, was basically what he's trying to wrap his, wrap his brain around. Um, when Barr is first there, for, for at least initially, he has, um, he lives for the first winter, he lives in a tent. Uh, he's roughing it. Gothic is about 10 miles away from the nearest town that actually had any supplies. It's actually completely unreachable except by ski during winter. Uh, so he lived in a tent for, for, for as long as he could, then moved over to this eight by 10 um, mining shack. And the only reason Barr winds up in this shack in this you know in this cabin is by a lucky lucky chance and a, and a problem with a a messy chain of title basically the rmbl is convinced that the cabin belonged to the u.s forest service the u.s forest service was convinced it belonged to the rmbl <laughs> um, uh, there's a local man in the area who also claimed it was his and so in this weird sort of triangle of confusion no one could really lay claim to it and so Barr just took it over so that first full winter when he's there, all he does is get up before daybreak, goes, you know, he, I'm sure he eats, you know, if you're, if you were living full time in winter at uh, Gothic is at 9,500 feet, 
your your, your caloric intake must be staggering. Uh, so gets up, eats a big breakfast, skis out in the woods, finds a dead tree, cuts it down, hauls it back, cuts it up. You know, he's stockpiling, getting exercise, but also stockpiling as much wood as he um, possibly can. And um, <laughs> But this, this is when he starts doing this research. And he says, quote, under, under kerosene light, you can't do much. But after a few years, I had something to compare each winter with. This is when he starts going out every morning and taking these detailed notes in these ledgers of not only the, the amount of snowfall twice a day, but also he would measure the snows, uh, basically its density, its volume. And so he would, he would take these notes uh, as well. So he's compiling these notes. Uh, and during the course of the winter, for many, many years, he's there by himself during the winter. And then a, the random group of folks show up during the summer to do you know more work. In the summer months, he would come down out of the, out of the mountain and work odd jobs. He'd uh, one summer worked fighting wildfires on a, a hot shot crew. He would wash dishes in the RMBL's kitchen. Um, the RMBL itself was... You know, you and I spent time at Ghost Ranch last year. It's yep. kind, of, kind of that vibe of a oh, bit okay. of a non yeah. nonprofit kind of, um, you know, you kind of have to kind of take care of your own stuff probably. Um, and, you know, everything is a little bit probably slipshod. No one's keeping track of bills and, you know, general upkeep was probably disastrous and especially upkeep <clears throat> at, with so much snow at elevation with shitty access, it's gotta be, gotta be hard. And so he's there year round. He becomes the unofficial caretaker for the place. So he, so when, when weather's bad, he shuts off, shuts off pipes. So things don't freeze. He's eyeballing research equipment in return for his sort of year round service. The lab gives him access to a car. So he can occasionally drive down Gotha, Colorado is, is immediately North of Crested Butte by only like 20 miles. Uh, so it's basically between Crested Butte and the area where Maroon Bell's and you know not far from snowmass aspen which i know you do right. very very well mm -hmm. um but you can't you can't drive I mean, there's um oh it's know, close but it's not close <laughs> right yeah right. it's 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 close as as the shit's long but it's not you know whatever um and uh but it's a long way around uh so it's that that part of um the state so um he's able to take care of himself reasonably well he does have access to a car uh he was always a bit of a numbers guy when he was growing up, he was big into baseball. He would, um, you know, take notes and keep detailed baseball stats on his favorite players. Pl favorite players. Hopefully, he wasn't a Yankees fan, but he probably was. <laughs> uh, and then early '80s, the guy who was the uh, director of the RMBL found out that Barr was good at numbers. Suggested Barr take um, an accounting class, which he did. And then in the early 1980s, Barr also becomes the lab's accountant. Um, and so um, by early 80s, Barr has moved out of the 8x10 shack, builds his own home uh, up in the mountains as well, about a half mile from where the lab is located in Gothic. He has solar panels. He has a greenhouse for vegetables. Apparently, weirdly, I don't, I don't get why this would be the case for anyone who's American. He is a big, big fan of both Bollywood films and cricket. Uh, and so those, the, so he has a little small home theater and that's, that's how he spends it. That's what he loves to watch. Like uh, that's sign right. of <laughs> right sign of mental disease, I guess. I don't know. Um, as he's gotten older, he's going to be able to become more relaxed on people. And it's, it's not like he's in complete social isolation year round. He does have several months where he is, where he is in town and he is around people a little bit. There are there are a few interviews um, with, with him, and if you've ever seen an interview with like Ted Kaczynski, you know any any of those guys that were for some reason, Brian, he's been on my mind the entire time you've been talking. <laughs> really? Well, th those guys that are the hardcore loners, when they when you do finally have, see an interview with them, they are stiff and they are stressed and they are awkward and they can't look at you um, because they've had they've lived in such profound isolation. This guy is the exact opposite. He obviously likes, he's a bit of an introvert and likes solitude and quiet, but he's this warm, sort of winsome, gentle guy who's very, very friendly and and quite um, just very content and at ease. He's not stressed at all, but he's, I guess, he just likes being by himself. Uh, if, you know, again, if you Google him, he's, he's in a couple of documentaries and there are several things of him on YouTube as well. He's a you know, really winsome, interesting kind of 
has a sort of silly persona about him, which is sort of um, interesting. So when, when he was much younger, he, he may have been a little more stiff or awkward. Uh, in this article, where most of this research came from, was from uh, Atlantic Monthly. This article uh, mentions the fact that one year he he decided to ski down into town to see a play at a local theater. And when he arrived, he was the only person in the audience. And the play's director wanted to call it off, but then everyone realized it was Barr who was, who was seated there. Because they reckon, <laughs> they reckon he has a long sort of Gandalf beard and he is string bean skinny. He's a really, really thin, thin guy. And so when they realized it was him and he's this local legend, sort of, they decided to put the play on anyway, just for him. Um, and he's also, I, mean, I judge even to this day, he's still the RMBL's accountant. Uh, and he, when he's there, he, I guess he must sit up front somewhere. So people, you know, he's, he's recognizable. People know who he is. Uh, and apparently he keeps like a hidden stash of candy, chocolate candy. And so when people, when people can't come in, he hands them little, little chocolate bars. And so, uh, and so he's just this really weird, but revered, uh, character in this town. All all this while now, forty five plus years, uh, at his home above the lab, he has been taking all of these notes every single day. Each stenographer's notebook uh, lasts for three years, and as he's taking these notes, he's not he has no academic training in any of this whatsoever. He developed his own code uh, for the different things he was he, he's keeping track of. In the morning and night, he goes out. Snow levels, monitors the weather, monitors temperature. He's monitoring wildlife. Um, so uh, he has these notations in red where uh, when, he, when he sees mammals coming out from hibernation, uh, first calls for spring from robins, from the flickers. Uh, and then um, there's one bird, a bird called the broad-tailed hummingbird, which was a bird that, um, that in a way was especially interested in and focused on because they're they're monitoring this bird and 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 it's timing to the area uh in terms of when it feeds on this particular flower called a glacier lily uh and all this is tied to basically to global warming so this data set uh in bar has lived in the area um for you know basically forever uh bar and in a way get to know each other at least a little bit in passing in a way is only there during the summer, but they become at least passing friends. It isn't until the 1990s that in a way in a passing conversation, and apparently neither one of them recall having this conversation, but at some point there's the realization that Barr has been collecting data for 25 years. And in a way is like, you've been doing what? Yeah. Um, I want to see your data. And so starting in the nineties, Barr starts sharing all of this, climate data and in a way is quoted as saying i realized right away what a valuable treasure it was uh, i knew what type of thing could be done with access to this type of historical record B billy Barr's notes uh now spanning close to 50 years are so exhaustive in their detail that they now have appeared in dozens of research papers focused on climate change science basically he has, you know, notes on the first snow of the year and last snow of the year, snowpack levels in between. Um, this this staggering level of things, and he, and he just did this to not be bored, basically. <laughs> um, and it's obviously, it's, you know, irrefutable that obviously climate change is real, but if you're trying to enact public policy or trying to you know, create change, you can't, you have to have data to back it up. There's a woman who's a, a hydrologist named Rosemary Carroll. Uh, she works at the Desert Research Institute and she used um, Barr's snowpack data and a bunch of other sources to model groundwater flow uh, in the Colorado area, Colorado River area, because where you live and like 40 million other people rely on river water and, you know, snow runoff as their only source of water uh and it's the data that billy barr has collected for all these decades that basically now is shaping water policy for dozens of southwestern cities i i guess you know maybe everywhere but certainly on the east facing side of the rocky mountains in colorado the front range yeah yeah in colorado and, and new mexico i guess um, in a way has, has included uh, bars records and in, in a bunch of studies. 
uh and um you know it's just a, a staggering amount of um uh, of data and work and now apparently bar's main job he's still collecting data but now instead of um rewriting it copiously in these little notebooks he is typing his data into spreadsheets and he's also transcribing all of his old uh all these old notebooks into spreadsheets as well so they're more easily shareable um so back to the uh in a way and the the hummingbird um that he was um he was so interested in that glacier lily um blooms at a, at a you know certain time of year and the hummingbird comes through this part of colorado basically within days of when this flower blooms because the climate is warming the lily is is now flowering earlier and earlier now it's now it flowers 17 days earlier than it did four decades ago and in 20 years they speculate that this bird will completely miss the glacier lily's nectar completely uh, and therefore, the bird will have to go somewhere else completely. This may seem like a, I don't know, a incredibly microscopic data point, but I find that incredibly interesting that they have this information and they're able to now plug this into this bright, broader context of what is going to, you know, going to be happening in this area and other areas, you know, presumably going forward by virtue of the fact that that you know, the climate is changing folks and, uh, and we are to blame. Wow. So anyway, incredibly interesting, uh, guy he's in a couple documentaries. Um, he's still living apparently in that cabin. He is in, uh, in this article, it says a not yet released documentary. This article from Atlantic monthly came out in January of 2017 uh, principal source, you know, Athletic Monthly uh, article article written by Jay Weston Fippen. So, End of Snow is one documentary which I have not watched. Not watched. There is another documentary which is really really short called Snow Guardian, which he is in, uh, and he's sort of funny and hilarious. There's, you know, he's in this video. Um, they they made him basically model all of his winter hats, and he's just kind of being silly and doing this. <laughs> like, um, but this really winsome, interesting, you know, intelligent dude um and uh you know living up in the mountains collecting all this data sometimes he's he's given uh you know he's cited as a source sometimes his data is is just you know pilfered and he's not given recognition I mean, you know he doesn't really seem to care as far as i can tell uh in the in the, in the snow guardian documentary the one of the one of the directors toward the the uh very end uh asks him I think uh, intending this to be a more br more broad piece of advice, but asks him, you know, do you have any do you have any advice you'd like you'd like to share? Uh, and he's talking about skiing, but this seems to apply to life in general. Billy Barr's uh, it, <laughs> general advice is: if you're going to fall, fall on your butt, not on your face. I mean, okay, well, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, good enough. <laughs> if you go to um, Gotha, Colorado, there is now the Billy Barr Community Center, which is tied to the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory. Um, and apparently he's still hanging out there and he, he's wandered, he wanders through town apparently occasionally, uh, in, in summer months. And if you well, want to see him in winter, winter, you probably can't. Well, uh, we go to Crested Butte every now and then. So I'll have to kick around down there and see, see what I can see. Um, yeah, that's, I, I got a few thoughts on that. I mean, one, it shows that you can be brilliant and live in a cabin and not bomb people, which I think is great. Right. Um, because Ted Kaczynski obviously resonates with this because Kaczynski is like concerned with the effects of technology in the modern world. That's what his manifesto is all about. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, and also just the impressive ability of an autodidact to do what he's done to basically teach himself data collection like that, where people typically go to school and take two or three years right. to do that kind of stuff. That is, that's just amazing. And he's just been doing this because, uh, and then it turned into something else. That's remarkable. Yeah. I mean, for, for, for our entire life, I mean, I was born in 1970. <laughs> so shortly after I was born, he started this and he's still doing it. That level of sort of myopic focus. I am sort of stunned by because I don't have it. <laughs> no, that, I mean, that's incredible. Um, so that just by itself, but then the fact that, 
it would become such a, a vital component to apparently so many other projects and initiatives and um you know tied to public policy essentially is is super interesting that, that it would just be a kind of a happy happy accident i guess but um amazing that just you know this random dude started you know want to do this and the whole glacier lily thing and, and the hummingbirds missing it because they keep changing because the, it keeps changing uh-huh. I, I got to admit that's how i feel when i come to texas and i've missed the green chili cheese water burger <laughs> um <laughs> you know just missing missing it by that much that's, damn it <laughs> that's amazing that's good stuff brian that gives us a little hope right that, that's a hopeful episode after what, what we've been putting each other through lately yeah so yeah uh, next next time next summer when i'm when i'm when i'm you know next time th- next summer <laughs> when i'm thinner and fitter i'm gonna, I'm gonna wander but wander up to because at one point you and i talk about going to maroon bells although um apparently that in a straight line it's like four miles but the drive i'm sure must be 100 yeah. miles and go all the way around yeah because you i think you'd have to come around the backside to get into uh to uh come in from aspen on the other side of the yeah. of the right. town yeah um that makes sense if you <laughs> how's that for direction giving folks that's 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 great <laughs> just turn um, left at the at the dead possum like, <laughs> see the mountain in front of you turn left there <laughs> well cool there you go mr billy Barr, the good one the good Billy. yes Barr. Mm-hmm. yes indeed well uh thanks for listening folks thanks for your rates and reviews got a story about jazz musicians today a little news catch up on uh, a particularly brutal form what's shaping up to be a brutal form of execution and a nice story about a self-taught environmentalist it's, that's a nice that's a nice round uh keeping keeping it varied complement of of subjects brian yeah so thanks for listening folks uh like and subscribe and uh give us five stars on whatever platform you're listening on you can actually now listen to us just on our website dreammediates.com and there are links to the merch and um instagram etc so we're out there reach out to us at dream idiots podcast at gmail and we will be back again very soon be good to each other